as I was thinking about Ecclesiastes chapter 3, two statements uh, came to mind, and I, I wrote them down, and they're very similar, but they're a big difference uh, in these two statements, and so I want to read them to get started with this morning. One of the greatest encouragements in the Christian life is knowing that God is sovereign, which means that God is in charge and that nothing happens outside of God's control. And then I wrote the second statement. One of the greatest challenges in the Christian life is knowing that God is sovereign, that He is in charge, and that nothing happens outside of His control. Now, if you notice, they're completely opposite. Okay? And, and, and I don't think, as I said, that there's anything more encouraging to me as a Christian than knowing that God is in charge. Knowing that God is in control. When bad things happen in our lives, when good things happen in our lives, it's encouraging to me as a Christian to be able to step back and say, you know what? Thank God that God is in charge. Thank God that God is in control. At the same time, how many of us have ever lost sleep wondering if God is in charge? And if God is in charge, why did these things happen? If God is in charge, why didn't he step in and change them? If God is in charge, why didn't he just make everything work out well? And, and so as I thought about God's sovereignty or God's being in charge, I thought, man, what an encouraging, frustrating truth that we have as, as Christians that are, that are taught to us in, in the Word of God. And I thought, you know, we tend to look at circumstances and situations that are, that are generally speaking, negative. And, and we become, with our limited understanding, we struggle to know, is God really in charge? And if He is, why doesn't He do things differently? Why doesn't He change things? And I realized that if, as we look at that, we look at it with very limited knowledge and very limited understanding. And there's a lot about God that we don't understand. And I've said in the past, I think it's been a while since I've said it, but I said, you know what? If I can understand everything about God, then he's not a very big God. And so I'm thankful that there's a lot that I can't understand about God. Because all that means is God's bigger than I am. And God's greater than I am. And that is so true. When it comes to the sovereignty, the control of God in all things. I'm also encouraged when I read Ecclesiastes chapter 3 that I'm not the only one that struggled with these things. Because Solomon, without question in my mind, is the wisest man that ever lived. And he was wise because God gave him his wisdom. Solomon, in the beginning of his reign, you know, God said to him, hey, whatever you want, I'll give it to you. And Solomon showed wisdom right up front. Because Solomon said, hey, you know what? I need wisdom. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rule your people, God. And I'm in a really scary position here because I'm ruling the people and I'm the king over the people that are God, your people. And I need your wisdom and I need your help. And God gave him wisdom. And he was by far the wisest man that ever lived. And yet in the first several chapters of Ecclesiastes, what's he struggling with? What is life all about? And he's struggling with... You know, where is God in the midst of these things? Where is God in, in my life as I look and as I struggle and, and, and just try to figure out what it's all about and where it's all at? And, and Solomon looked at the last couple of weeks, we've talked about these in more detail, but he looked at his accomplishments. He said, man, I've done some great things. And yet it's empty. Where's the value? Last week we said that he, he looked at pleasure. And he said, man, I tried all kinds of fun. I tried everything from alcohol to enjoyment to everything else. Man, it's empty. It, it, the life is not there. And he said, I had tried my wisdom and acquiring knowledge, and I tried everything that I could think of. And it all left me empty. It left my life wanting and lacking something. He said it was like chasing the wind. Now in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, Solomon begins the chapter by sharing what he knows is true. He, he begins by sharing what he knows is true, and yet he ends the, the, the chapter struggling over what he knows to be true. And as I thought about that this morning, I, I thought, you know, 
Solomon starts here in verses 1 to 11 by saying, this is what I know to be true. And I thought, you know, when we are seeking after truth, and when we are seeking after what is right, we always have to begin by what the Bible says is true. And then build the rest of our understanding from there. And not, not another way around. Because so many people today base what they believe to be true, not off of what the Bible says is true. They base it off what they see and hear and experience. And if we base truth off what we see and hear and experience, we're going to have a mess. It's going to be wrong. And, and, and too often, too often people say, well, this has to be true because I see it and I hear it and I experience it. Now, now let me see what the Word of God says and how can I prove that from the Word of God? And it's wrong. It's backwards. Solomon starts by saying, let me tell you what is true. And then he backs up and says, now let me tell you what I see. And there's a contradiction, or at least a seeming contradiction. And, and, and so that really is the struggle of, of chapter 3. But, but let's start by saying what, what Solomon says here is true. Solomon begins by saying this. There's a, a time for everything. There's a time for everything. He says there's a time to be born, and there's a time to die. There's a time to laugh. And a time to cry. There's a time to, to fight a war. And there's a time for peace. And I'm not going to go through the whole list here. Because it's right there. It's in front of you. And you can see it. But he says there's a time for everything. Now, I struggled for a little bit. Okay, now what do I take from that? What do I gather? What can I learn from that? What, what does Solomon say? And here's what I think he's saying. Anytime in scripture you see that there is a pointed time for something. It points to a truth that we can grab a hold of. It points to the fact that God is in charge. It points to the fact that God is in control. If, if everything happens in the time that God ordained it, God is in charge of it. God is in control of it. If, if, if God wasn't in charge, then there's not a specific time for everything. It's just random. It happens to and chance. But if, but if God is saying here through Solomon that there's a time for everything, and that God makes things beautiful in his time, then God has to be in charge. God has to be in control. Now, let me, let me share a couple of the illustrations that I thought of in Scripture, and some were ones that you shared with me in our Bible study last Sunday night. But one of the areas in the Bible that we see that in is in regards to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Notice what it says in Galatians chapter 4. It says, notice the verse starts this way. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Now, why did Jesus Christ, why was he born when he was? He tells us, Paul says there, when the fullness of time had come. When the ordained time set up and planned by God came, Jesus was born in a manger in Bethlehem. That was God's time. Why did it happen when it did? It was God's control. God ordained that time. God chose that time. And, and so the, 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 the birth of Christ was in a time that God had set up. If you go to Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 10, we see the same idea. It says, in him, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Again, we see God's timing. We see the, the timing and the plan of God in sending Jesus Christ to unite or to bring all things to himself. When? In his time. God is in control and we see that in the fullness of time here in regards to the birth, 
the death, the burial, and, and the resurrection of, of Jesus Christ. As I thought about God's time, my mind also went back to the book of Esther. You're familiar with the book of Esther and all that, that took place there. I could preach the rest of the sermon on Esther this morning, and I'm not going to do that, I promise. But, but Esther is a book that talks about God's timing. And in Esther, we see a, a man named uh, uh, Haman decided he was going to get rid of all the Jewish people. He was going to have them just destroyed. In part because he hated another man. And his name was what? Mordecai. And he hated him. He said, I'm going I'm to destroy him and I'm going to destroy all of the, the Jewish people. And, and he had a law that was set in motion. And there was one person that could do something about that. And it was Esther. And she was really the only one that had the king's ear. She was the only one that could talk to the king at, at this particular time. And Mordecai called her aside and, and, and said this. He said, Esther, if you keep silent uh, at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from somewhere else. But if you and your father's house, but you and your father's house will perish. And then he says, Who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Mordecai said to Esther, Listen. This is God's timing. You are in the palace. You have the king's ear. You can talk to him. Nobody else can. And he said, Esther, if you don't go talk to the king, somebody else will. You may die, and the Jewish people may die, but God will work his plan anyway. But Esther, I believe God brought you here for this particular time. Again, God's control. God seen, or his control seen in, in the timing. Turn back, I get carried away on this, but I think it's a, just an important point. Turn back to Genesis 17. I want to read this right out of our Bibles this morning. Genesis 17. We see God's timing in something else. Beginning at verse 15, and then read with me down through verse 21. Genesis 17, verse 15. And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall be, and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. Then Abraham, Abraham fell on his face and laughed, and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear us a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. God said, No, Sarah, your wife, shall bear a son, and you will call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. And he shall father twelve princes, and I will make him a great nation. And then verse 21, But I will establish my covenant with Isaac. Whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. Now, do you see God's timing in that verse? When God says to Abraham, hey, you and Sarah are going to have a son. What did they, how did Abraham respond? He fell on his face and laughed. <laughs> what a cruel joke that is. That'll never happen. Why did Abraham say that? Because Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah was 90. The timing wasn't right, right? The time wasn't right. God, if you were going to give us a son, you should have done that 60 years ago. When I was, you know, a lot younger. And my wife was younger and she could have children then. But God, the time is wrong. What was God's timing? Next year at this time, you and your wife Sarah is going to be pregnant. Now, what did the timing point to? Who's in charge? Was it Abraham? Was it Sarah? Absolutely not. It was God. God was in charge. And we see God being in charge in, in, in God's time. It's interesting getting back to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. It's interesting to me that when Solomon points out here that there's a time for everything, all of them are opposites. They're all opposites. 
There's a time to be born. What's the opposite of that? It's time to die. There's a time to plant. It's time to harvest. There, there's a lot of opposites here. There's a, generally speaking, there's a positive and, and a negative. Now, we don't have any trouble this morning seeing God's um, sovereignty in the positive things, do we? We don't have any trouble with that at all. Okay? Time to be born. Man, I'm so glad God's in control. Man, it's so exciting to have a new baby born. And man, God is good. God is so good. Man, look at this new life. This is exciting. What about a time to die? How many have ever said, man, God's timing is good when we lost a loved one? Nobody. Hardly ever do you hear that. Well, what about... What about he says there's a time to there's a time to kill? Wow, is God really in control? Is God really in control? How about a time to heal? What an exciting thing when God works and, and, and heals somebody. Man, God is good. What about a time to uh, a time to weep? If we're weeping, are we often thinking about God being in control? Maybe, maybe not. How about a time to laugh? I love to laugh. I love to laugh. Well, yeah, I'm laughing. Things are good. God's in control. Well, what about when I weep? How about a time to love? Time to hate? Time for war? Time for peace? It, it, it's interesting to me that, you know, it's easy to see God in charge in one half of all of those things, but not the other half. And yet Solomon's truth here is God is in charge. Whether it's a time to be born or whether it's a time to die, God's still in charge. He hasn't lost control. How about a time to, to heal and a time to kill? Whether somebody is healed or somebody is killed, God is still in charge. And that is, I, I believe that is the truth of, of, of Scripture. Notice what he concludes down in, in verse 11. He has made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he has put eternity into man's hearts, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. He said, God's made everything beautiful in his time. Not in our time. Not in my time. If I look at some of the things that happen in, in my life, and I see some of the things that happen in your life, in your lives, I, I may say, man, that's not beautiful. It's ugly. And it's painful. And we don't like any of those times. And I don't think Solomon is saying, hey, you need to like those times. I don't think he's saying that. But what he is doing is saying, listen, God is in charge. God is in control, even if it appears that he's out of control. And he says in verse 11, God made everything beautiful in his time. And then he says, we have eternity in our hearts. And I, and I struggled with that. We have eternity in our hearts. What is he saying there? I believe at least in part what he's saying is we have a desire to know and understand what God's doing. And, and it's natural for us to sit back and say, man, if God's in charge, why is this happening? I don't get it. We have, we have that desire. We have that yearning in our hearts because I, I believe in part God gave it to us. And yet, even though we have that desire, we can't always understand what God's doing. We can't always get it. We don't always know. But our not knowing, our lack of understanding, doesn't take away from the fact that God is in charge. It doesn't change anything. Just because I can't understand it doesn't mean, doesn't mean that it's not true. And just because I can't see it with my eyes doesn't mean that it's not true. Solomon begins with the truth. And the truth is, God is in charge. There's a time and a season for everything. And God makes all things beautiful in his time. God is in charge. In verses 12 and 13, what's the benefit of knowing that? What's the benefit of knowing that? If I know God is in charge, Solomon says, I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also, that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. The benefit 
of knowing that God is in charge is that I can enjoy what God has given me. I can enjoy what God's given me. You see, in the first two chapters, Solomon has looked at everything that he's done, everything that God has given him, and he said, I can't enjoy this because it's all vanity. Why would I enjoy everything that I have? I'm going to die. Why can I enjoy that? It's, it makes me miserable. I know what the end is. I know where I'm going. And so I can't enjoy my success, and I can't enjoy what I have. It was just like last week. I quoted the girl on my soccer team who came to me and said, Why do I have to do good on a test in school? I'm just going to die someday. And I told you, I don't know where that came from. I've never heard a girl in my 10 or 12 years of coaching, I've never heard somebody say that. And I started a series in Ecclesiastes, and the very next day she came to practice and said that. And I said, hey, you need to come to church on Sunday morning, because that's exactly what we're talking about. But I thought, you know, but, but Solomon started the first two chapters, and he said, I have all these things, and I can't enjoy them, because I'm going to die. And now he says in chapter 3, wait a minute, God's in charge. And because God is in charge, he says, there's nothing better for me, than, for, for me than being joyful and eating and drinking and enjoying everything that God gave me. Now, he's not talking about a prosperity gospel. He's not talking here about God giving me everything that I need so that I can just love and enjoy and not have to worry about it. That's not what he's saying. But what he's saying is, I can enjoy what God has given me. He's given me life. He's given me, and Solomon would probably say this, he's given me a family. He's given me the ability to work. He's given me the ability to have pleasure. And Solomon is saying, if God is in charge and God has given me those things, then I can enjoy those things because they're a gift from God. God wants me to enjoy them. God wants me to enjoy life. Now, my life is not just all about enjoying me and enjoying my pleasure in my things. That's not what Solomon is saying. But we can enjoy what God has given us because God's given it to us. And I can work and I can enjoy my work because God's given it to me. And I can enjoy my family because God's given them to me. And I can enjoy pleasure because God's given me the ability to do that. And I don't have to think, what's the use because someday it's all going to be gone. I can say, you know what, I can enjoy it because God gave it to me to enjoy and part of God's plan is for me to enjoy what he's, what he's blessed me with. And I can do that because I know that God is in charge. God is in control. And the things that I do are not a waste of time. The things that I enjoy in life are not a waste of time. God gave them to me. And, and I don't know about you, but one of the greatest blessings, one of the greatest ways that I find fulfillment in life, is by knowing that I'm a part of what God is doing. I don't think there's any greater blessing than saying, you know what, God is working in my life. God is using me. God is blessing me. And if I'm a part of what God is doing to me, that is, that is exciting. That's a, that's a tremendous thing. And so Solomon says, because God is in charge, I can, I can enjoy what, what God has blessed me with. We see that as well in verses uh, 14 and 15. He said, I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor can anything be taken away from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. That which is already has been, and that which is to be already has been. And God seeks that which is, uh, God seeks what has been driven away. What's he saying? Everything God does is certain. It's all been planned. Again, he comes back to the fact that God is in charge. God is in control. That, that's what he's saying. God is in charge. Now, that's the truth. Solomon says this is true. In verse, in, in verse 16, he turns a corner. Because he goes from saying this is true to looking with his eyes and saying, well, what do I see in the world? And if you notice in, verse, in chapter 4, He's going to begin verse 16 by saying, I saw. In chapter 4, he begins in verse 1. Again, I saw. In verse 4 of chapter 4, then I saw. Now, here's where the conflict comes. And it would be easy to end the message this morning by saying, man, God is in charge. Great thing, let's pray. 
Don't bow your head, we're not done yet. Okay, Derek puts that on Facebook for me. When the preacher says we're almost done and it doesn't end. So, I'm not saying we're done. But it would be easy to end right there and say, hey, God is in charge, go home and feel good. But Solomon doesn't stop there because the challenge isn't in saying God is in charge. The challenge is, okay, now, what do I see? And so Solomon begins to look around and notice what he sees in verse 16. He says, Moreover, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, even there was wickedness. And in the place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. And I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for every matter uh, and for every work. And then I said in my, in my heart with regard to the children of Israel, <coughs> that God is testing them, that they may see... Uh, that they may see that they themselves are but beasts. For what happens to the children of man and what happens to beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath, and man has no advantage over the beast. All is vanity. Solomon comes right back to his human point of view without God again. And he says, listen, God is in charge. And then he looks out, I don't know, I'm just speculating, he looks out of his palace window, and I have no idea where he's looking. But he looks out the window, and he says, but what do I see? And he said, where I should see justice, it's wickedness. And where there should be righteousness, and God, you know, the righteous people ought to be prospering and pushing ahead, and everything ought to be great. And he said, I look, and instead of the righteousness, they're wicked. And, and the righteous are, are being oppressed. We're going to see that in chapter 4. The righteous are being oppressed, and the wicked are rising up. Where's God? And then he looks at the, the beasts of the field. And this is a real downer. He looks at the beasts of the field and he says, how is, the, how is the, the cow in the pasture any different than I am? We all breathe the same air and we all return to the dust from where we came. And so he says, I look out and I, 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 I know God is in charge. There's a time and a season and God does things beautiful, but... but why then do I see this? I read an illustration this week that I thought was funny. I didn't read it. I heard it. I thought it was a riot. It said they, a man got on an airplane. And I'm not a big flyer. I've done it, but it's not my favorite thing. But uh, he said a guy gets on the airplane, and, and he comes back down the airplane, and he gets to his seat on a ticket, and he looks, and there's a, a businessman sitting in his seat. And he said he's got a nice suit on and a tie. It's one of those expensive suits. He says, excuse me, sir, I'm sorry, but you're in my seat. And the guy looks back at him and he says, I am not getting out of this seat. This is my seat and I'm sitting here. You can go sit somewhere else. So the guy says, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he calls the stewardess back and he says, listen, this man's in my seat and I don't know what to do. She says, you know what? Just kind of sit over here. Just, just sit over here. Let's just, you know, let's just forget the whole thing and let him sit there and don't worry. So he says, okay, this, the seat next to this businessman was empty. And obviously he wanted it because it was empty. And he liked to have room next to him. And, and so he said, I sat down and he said, just before the plane got ready to take off, I looked and he said, on come a young mother with a, with a, a toddler in her arm. <laughs> Guess where she sat? <laughs> right next to the businessman. And the businessman got on his laptop computer after the plane took off and, and tried to work it. And toddlers are all the same. This toddler talked nonstop. The entire flight. And the businessman got nothing done. And then just before the plane got ready to land, all of a sudden this toddler got dead quiet. Not a word. And all of a sudden, he or she was plain sick. And everything came up. All over this businessman's suit. And he was covered with vomit from head to toe. And the plane landed and it taxied in and, and they got off the plane. And, and as this other man, the businessman got off and got off the plane. And as the other man started down the aisle, the wait, the, 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 not the waitress, the stewardess said, wait right there just a minute. She said, I don't know what she wanted. So he said, I stepped over out of the aisle and let everybody else go by. And he said, as everybody got off the plane, he said, she came down the aisle with two wine glasses and a bottle of champagne. <laughs> And handed him one and poured it, and they toasted what happened, and they got off the planes. <laughs> and I thought, you know, it was a silly illustration. 
But I thought, isn't that what we think life ought to be like? Isn't that it? We think, you know what? Those that are wicked, man, they need to be judged right now. Boom, you got what you deserve. Good for you. You know? That's what we think of life. And Solomon looks at life and he says, it's not like that. Does that mean God's not in charge? Does that mean that God's not working? Does that mean God has lost control? Because I look into the world that we live in today and I see the same thing. I see injustice and I see wickedness and I see right, the righteous or those that are striving to live righteous being suppressed. And I see the wicked thriving. Does that mean God has lost control? No, it doesn't. It looks that way. It appears that way. But Solomon says, even they will be judged in God's time. Solomon is frustrated, as you and I have been many times. Where is God? Where is he? Why are these things happening? And yet God is still in charge. God is still in charge. You know, as we finish this morning, I thought, you know, as I, just as I started, the truth of God's sovereignty can be encouraging, and it can be discouraging. And when it's discouraging, it's because we're only looking with limited view. We really cannot completely see and understand what God is doing. We can't. It's not in our, it's not in our nature. We are not God. We can't understand what God is doing. And, and there's times that we need to just sit back and say, Okay, God, I know what your word says. And I know it's true because I've seen you work so many times in my life in the past. And I have no idea what you're doing now. It doesn't even look, God, like you're there. But I know you are because your word says that it's true. I just need to sit back and trust God that you're going to work. Now, I want you to do one thing for me this week. I want you to, this week, today, tomorrow, I want you to take a three-by-five card or a piece of paper. I don't really care. And, and, and write down on that three-by-five card one circumstance that you're struggling with. A situation, a circumstance that you're struggling with right now and saying, God, I don't know where you're at. I'm so frustrated. I'm angry. I don't know what's going on. I don't know where God is. And I want you to write that on the front of that 3 by 5 card. And then I want you to take uh, 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 something a little bolder to write with other than a pen or a pencil, maybe a marker. And I want you to write diagonal all the way across that card. God is in charge. And I want you to take that card and either... Stick it in your Bible or on the mirror in the bedroom or in the bathroom or on a refrigerator or in the middle of the kitchen counter. And, and, and every time you begin to struggle this week saying, where is God? What's God doing? I don't get it. I want you to pull that card out. And I want you to look at it and remember that whatever it says underneath, the important thing is God is still in charge. God is still in charge. And as you look at that card, take a moment and pray and say, God... Thank you that even though I don't know what you're doing, I'm thankful that you're still in charge. And God, I need your strength and I need your courage to face this hardship and this difficulty. And God, I'm excited to see how you're going. And draw encouragement from the truth that everything is beautiful in God's time. Let's take a moment and pray. Father, I thank you this morning for your word. Thank you that even as Solomon has struggled in these first three chapters with life, I thank you that in the midst of it, he recognized that as God, you were in charge. And that even though he saw wickedness and hardship and struggle, you were still there. You were still at work. Lord, we have struggled, I have struggled so many times in my own life with that same problem. I know your word says you're in charge. I know you have demonstrated it to me over and over. And yet I simply can't see it in what I'm dealing with now. And so being a human, I begin to doubt and I begin to question. Lord, I pray this week that as we struggle with various things in our lives, that you would give us the courage, the strength, and Lord, what we need to grab a hold of the fact that you are in charge. And Lord, I pray that even as we struggle, that we would be excited to see how you're going to work. 
And Lord, I pray that we would not become so consumed with our struggles and our difficulties that we would miss you, Lord. Help us to see what you're doing. And Lord, even if we can't completely understand, give us glimpses of the fact that you're still God and you're still in charge. Encourage us by these things. We thank you in Jesus' name.